Welcome, everyone, to the On Poly Podcast. I'm Steve Pakin. And I'm John Michael McGrath. Today on the pod, the NDP, official opposition, tries to get the Ford government to take the tolls off Highway 407 for truckers. Has the province made peace with all of the teachers' unions? The government has landed an agreement with the English Catholic Teachers' Union, ensuring the school year won't be disrupted. And in our weekly Your Column, My Column feature, I'll look back at the life and times of Brian Mulroney, his relationship with three Ontario premiers when he was prime minister, and the loss of all three political titans from those historic elections of the 1980s. And I will focus on something uh, completely different. (laughs) It is Friday, March the 8th, 2024, so let's get to it. Okay, partner, first of all, a couple of things off the top here. Yes, my throat is terrible tonight, (laughs) as you can probably hear. I was at the Leaf game the other day, and it was 1-1 going into overtime. And Austin Matthews, of course, he's truly amazing. He is truly... Do you know who I'm talking about, first of all? Uh, he is a hockey player. Oh, I'm my guess. goodness. I get, yeah. I have so much work to do with you. But yes, <laughs> Austin Matthews, who is the greatest goal scorer of this generation, popped one in overtime, and I guess I overdid it. And anyway, so I'm not going to sound too good for See, this this pod. is why I, I don't do live sports, because I got to <laughs> keep the, the voice fresh for the one podcast a week I do. That's Very good. Do your Very work. good. Now, second thing, I see you are sporting a different shirt this week. And yes. back in my day, we had nine planets. So this is a reference to? Uh, the the former uh, unjustly maligned planet of Pluto. Um, you know, uh, uh, those of us who uh, watched this drama unfold over, it took, I think, most of a decade. Uh, but yeah, Pluto was stripped of its uh, title as a planet. But uh, I, I, I guess in this case, I'm, I'm uh, insisting on the old orthodoxy. <laughs> Do you know what I found very funny about that shirt was not the part that you found funny, but I always find it amusing when someone as young as you says, back in my day... <laughs> I don't. Did you have a day? Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> we're going to be talking about the 1980s uh, a, a lot, and uh, you know, I, I, I was born in '81, and uh, a lot of my early uh, early memories are the 1980s, and so yeah, I think of myself as like an '80s and '90s kid, there uh, you go. old enough to remember the sound of a dial-up modem. That's what distinguishes hey. me from. Uh, let's say some of our our younger colleagues who are coming up behind me and. Like, young, talented people, and I just see them in the rear view, and I'm realizing, oh gosh, my. My day is coming. <laughs> you know you know, we call people like that? Whippersnappers. Young whippersnappers. That's what I call them. Uh, I'm going to point to something on my shirt. Do, yes. you, do you actually know what that is? Uh, that would be the uh, Hamilton Tiger Cats. Correct. How do you know that? Well, I, I have been hosting a podcast with you for the last <laughs> okay. several years. He can be taught. All yes, right. That's uh, great. By yes. osmosis, if nothing else. I know football season is still four months away, but uh, I'm getting ready. Okay? I'm getting ready. Absolutely. Anyway, shall we do it? Uh, let's get to it. On to issue one. Okay, here's the situation. Highway 401 across the middle of the Greater Toronto Area is used by truckers a lot. Highway 407 across the top of the GTA isn't used by truckers very much at all because it is a toll highway. Costs too much to use. So the official opposition, you Democrats, thought, why not take the tolls off the 407 for truckers? It would presumably ease up on the congestion on the 401 and encourage greater use of the 407 which is quite underutilized. NDP leader Marit Stiles saying the Premier is too afraid of the private operator of the 407 to do it. Doug Ford, to say the least, disagrees. So back to the Premier. When are you going to start prioritizing the interests of Ontario's, Ontarians instead of big corporations? Speaker, let me get this right. You're against the 412 and 418. You voted against getting rid of the tolls. You voted against the 413. You voted against the Bradford Bypass. You voted against the largest transit expansion in North America. But like, which way are you going today? Are you going one way? Are you going the other way? Ah, yes, a little bit of the exchange from the House this past week. Now, the official opposition indicate that they have done a study by a group called Environmental Defense which says if we did what the NDP are suggesting, it would obviate the need to build that Highway 413 at a cost of $6 billion. It would avoid damaging the green belt. It would save truckers 80 minutes of travel time through the GTA. So add all that up, and I'm going to ask you a question I already know the answer to. (laughs) Do you think the Premier is considering changing his mind on this? Uh, We know that he is not, uh, (laughs) at least not right now, because uh, the uh, Tories, the majority in the legislature, uh, did vote against the NDP motion and, uh, uh, you know, sent it to purgatory. (laughs) Is there a reason that they oppose the NDP motion 
other than it's a motion put forward by the NDP. <laughs> Well, you know, I said this last week that, you know, this idea keeps being proposed as an alternative to building the 413 highway. Uh, This would go uh, across the sort of the northwest of the GTA, I guess. Um, And this government is not looking for an alternative to build the 413. They want to build the 413. Um, So they just want to keep going ahead with that. Um, You know, I do think it's fair to say that there's a bit of an inconsistent attitude, let's say, uh, towards tolls with this government where, um, you know, they they went through this big song and dance about uh, prohibiting new tolls on publicly owned highways. Um, But they are not considering, at least do not seem to be uh, considering a measure like this, which is is a, a real tangible thing that the government could do at the cost of some money, and we'll get into that. Um, but uh, it, it is a tangible thing they could do to, to affect congestion and, and potentially improve people's lives um, pretty quickly. Well, that's what I wonder, because you could be in favor of building the 413 and still do this anyway, because after all, it's going to take a decade to build the 413, right? It's not going to be around for a while. And traffic, presumably, on the 401 is only going to get worse between now and when the 413 is ready. So is there any way that the province could be better utilizing the 407 in the interim? Well, that's part of the appeal of this whole idea is that you you could actually implement it relatively quickly. Maybe it couldn't be done instantaneously, but it seems like plausibly the kind of thing that you could get up and running in a year's time, let's say, Um, whereas it will take something like a decade to build uh, the 413. Um, So you could do this faster. Uh, Environmental Defense argues that it would be cheaper to do so. They say $4 billion over 30 years, as opposed to somewhere between six to $10 billion to build the 413. Um, But uh, the the government is, as we say, not like super interested in this idea. Uh, Worth noting here that the 407 is actually one of the most expensive uh, toll highways in uh, the, or on the continent. Um, Its uh, rates do continue to go up and because it is uh, privately operated and the, the conditions of the lease that uh, the province signed back you know, more than 20 years ago, um, the, uh, the province really doesn't have any kind of lever to pull in terms of lowering those rates. Now, you went on the record last week with a position that will be extremely popular in the suburbs of the greater Toronto area. Namely, you're in favor of toll highways. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that in general, um, you know, we are not going to build, let's say, uh, something analogous to like the DVP or uh, the Gardner in downtown Toronto again. Uh, the the era of big highway building, at least certainly in in the the core of the region, is basically done, and I think we can sort of admit that. Um, and so, how do you handle congestion uh, without trying to, you know, do these massive new engineering projects? Well, toll roads are a a tried and true method to do that. Um, You know, even in places where they are expanding highways, and I think of like there are cities in Texas, Texas loves highways, everything's bigger in Texas. (laughs) Um, But you know, you see time and time again, like you add four lanes to a highway on the promise that it's going to save drivers five minutes in their commute. Never does. Yeah, like Never a does. year later, the, you know, it's yeah. back to, you know, or in fact, congestion can even get worse. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, toll roads are, are a solution to congestion that actually works. And I think this is a, a, a not an issue right now, but as we have more electric vehicles on the road, the government is going to be looking for some way to replace the gas tax. Um, mm. And, you know, you already see lots of jurisdictions around North America trying to figure out what that's going to look like. Uh, road tolls might be one answer. That is a really good point. I, I, I had forgotten the notion that the, uh, well, governments everywhere depend on taxes from gasoline a lot. And if you've got a lot of EVs and a lot fewer people buying gas, you do have to replace that money somehow, don't you? Yeah, well, you're, well, I, one answer is no, you don't, right? Just <laughs> let the, you know, and this would be, I think, a, a, an answer that Doug Ford would be totally comfortable with. Right now, we don't have to replace the gas tax. Let the consumers keep that savings, and we'll figure out another way to bring that money in, right? Income taxes and sales taxes still work. Uh, but I think in general, governments kind of is certainly, let's say, bureaucrats in the finance ministry probably start to get hives when you say, like, <laughs> when you talk about not replacing the gas tax. There you go. Now, let us also state your dirty little secret. Well, dirty little not so secret for the record. <laughs> yes. You don't own a car, do I you? I don't. No. You, do you, you take transit and you bicycle everywhere. 
Uh, yeah, no, and I walk. I, I walk. I bike. Uh, I, I bike through most of the year. I, I did not bike a lot in December and January this year. Um, but uh, you know, we're recording this in early March, and, and I, I biked to work today. So uh, people who drive cars for a living may not love your solution. <laughs> they might be is what I'm trying to say. Foaming at the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it does seem self interested. I, I, I grant. Um, but you know, I do certainly. I, I rent cars frequently. I have family who live all over uh, different parts of the province and we, we rent a car when we uh, uh, need to. I actually do enjoy driving once you get out of the city proper. Mm. Um, so so I'm, I'm sympathetic to the ideas that like driving is a lot of fun, but <laughs> yeah, uh, I, 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 I'm not the ideal uh, spokesperson for this idea. I just can't wait for you to run for office in the north end of Etobicoke <laughs> on the platform of bicycles for all and we're going to toll all your roads. Oh, yeah, no, there's, there's a reason I will never hold elected <laughs> office. All of my views are politically unpopular. <laughs> <laughs> now, let us just, before we leave this subject, give credit where it's due because it was the leader of the Green Party, Mike Schreiner, who was the first to float this idea almost two years ago, didn't go anywhere then, may not go anywhere this time because, of course, the Ford government does seem determined to build 413. But let's take a... Um, Let's just take a second and talk about the politics of all this, because I found it fascinating that the government, I think in a very real respect, got itself outflanked by the NDP on the issue of consumer choice and affordability. And if we know this premier, uh, we know those are issues that are near and dear to his heart. And my suspicion is, and I got nothing to hang my hat on here other than just suspicion, had he announced this idea, it would have been consistent with his brand and I could imagine him, you know, beating the drum for this. I can imagine he would like this a lot. Uh, and yet, uh, the politics of it seems to me he got outflanked by the NDP on it. Yeah, and so, you, you know, you ask, like, why isn't the government uh, uh, embracing this this kind of a notion? And, and, you know, to go back to the cost, right, like, it would be a substantial cost, right? Um, you know, the environmental defense analysis uh, looked at, I think, in the range of $260 million a year. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's reason to think that number might even be conservative, that, you know, uh, it, it could potentially be more uh, than that. And, you know, governments are funny, like, in, in some ways, you know, if they talk about spending, like, $1 billion in one big lump sum versus... A few hundred million, but like a few hundred million a year for ten years. Right. They're like actually they'll be more nervous about the smaller uh, expense uh, over a longer period of time. Right. Mm -hmm. they, like it's it's the ongoing expenses that make uh, again those those bureaucrats in the finance ministry. It may, it's those ongoing perpetual expenses uh, that that make them nervous. So I, I think that would be one reason because of course the the other issue that is sort of in the background of everything this government does, and you know this has been a, a very common story over the last uh, let's say a few decades, is just trying to balance the budget. Uh, you know this premier and his finance minister Peter Bethlen Falvey would very much like to balance the budget before the next election, um, and adding even a few hundred million dollars a year in new ongoing expenses, you know, potentially for decades to come, that makes that idea of balancing the budget harder to get to. And they announced Budget Day uh, just yesterday, right? March yes. 26th is going to be Budget be Day. Tuesday, March 26th. Right. So uh, I imagine you'll be covering that uh, intensely on the agenda. And then I you and I will... expect we will both be doing something uh, on that. And then you and I will be discussing it on the podcast later that week. Good stuff. Okay, on to issue two. This week, Education Minister Stephen Lecce announced the province has a tentative agreement with the Ontario English Catholic Teachers Association. The teachers will have a chance to ratify, or not, on March 26. If they do, it means the government will have successfully achieved labour peace with all of the teacher unions. Okay, JMM, how big a deal is that? Well, I mean, it's certainly a big deal that uh, it's a big deal for any government when they secure this kind of uh, labor peace uh, among the education sector. Really, you know, uh, potentially the most disruptive thing that can really derail a government's agenda is, is a, like a big teacher strike. So when you get to avoid that, I, I imagine there's a lot of people uh, uh, breathing a sigh of relief in the mm -hmm. premier's office. Um, but of course, the province, the process rather, um, has not been without controversy, I think we could say. You are quite right about that. Do you want to take us through some of the controversies along the way? Well, so, I mean, I think you have to go back to uh, Bill 124, which uh, this government introduced in its first uh, mandate. Uh, it was, in fact, Peter Bethman Falvey before he was uh, Minister of Finance introduced this bill that uh, constrained the growth of uh, public sector compensation. I think as we always uh, do say when we talk about this bill that it did affect uh, those of us here at TVO and we're just going to 
concede that and keep on moving. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, that was obviously extremely controversial. Uh, it was eventually uh, ruled unconstitutional uh, by the courts, and the government has decided not to appeal it all the way to the Supreme Court. So they've accepted the judgment of the Ontario mm-hmm. Court of Appeal that it was unconstitutional. Um, that is going to have some knock on effects in terms of the government's finances. They will probably end up uh, paying retroactive. Uh, pay to uh, some unions to to make up for the wages that were lost due to Bill 124. Um, uh, it seems like wild that this was like 18 months ago, but of course the government also uh, briefly invoked the notwithstanding clause to try and prohibit strikes by the teachers unions. That was a huge controversy. The government eventually backed down, um, uh, repealed that bill that uh, uh, had threatened to use the, the notwithstanding clause. And then just as a, another l- little legal uh, uh, Factoid: um, They declared that uh, the 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 uh, labor dispute that had happened uh, was never illegal because you can retroactively declare things to not have happened <laughs> um, uh, when you're the the parliament uh, or the legislature. Um, you know, uh, and and the unions were uh, they, they had voted for strike mandates uh, in many cases, so there was at least the real potential of uh, some some disruption. Uh, during the school year here, and uh, the fact that the government has um, uh, extricated itself uh, from these problems without getting a strike, without any massive disruption uh, to the school year, uh, as I say, people breathing a sigh of relief, I imagine. Indeed. Now, I I imagine some of you are asking yourself, has this ever happened before where we got labor peace with all of the different teacher unions all at the same time? And the answer is yes, this is not unprecedented, but it has not happened in a long time. The last time labor peace broke out was in 2008. Premier Dalton McGuinty was in charge. His government successfully bargained with all of the teacher unions. And I think some of us who follow this stuff will remember that the Minister of Education at the time was? Uh, Was Kathleen Wynne. Kathleen Wynne. There you go. You know, this is a a recurring story in Ontario politics. Uh, You know, as education has become more and more central to what the provincial government does, right? We're no longer in the, you know, early 1900s when education was like just a purely local matter handled by school boards, right? It really has risen to uh, a a central focus in uh, provincial government. And so, you know, you go back to the 1970s uh, when I was in uh, elementary school in the 1980s and then the night, of course, during the Harris years of the 1990s, right? uh, Days of action. Yeah, exactly. Labor disputes uh, uh, in the education sector. I mean, I don't think I had a single school year that wasn't disrupted at least somewhat between, you know, uh, grade nine and uh, I, I was one of the last years to have OAC or grade 13, right? right? Um, you, you, you probably did not enjoy the fact that your school year was disrupted, but uh, I think most kids probably were. Uh, I mean, I found <laughs> other things to do. Oh, okay. All right, good. <laughs> You know, I I do find myself wondering if this is also at least a little bit of like a COVID hangover, right? I I actually have not asked any of the uh, union leaders uh, this question, um, and maybe I should, but I, 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 I find myself wondering if they were really confident that after 2021, Um, and a bit of 2022 when schools were, you know, shut down briefly, um, how much support they think they would have had among Ontario's parents Mm. if uh, a strike had shut down schools for a a lengthy period of time. Um, You know, maybe they would have had a lot of support. Uh, I think there there is some sympathy to, to teachers just generally in the public, but I think it's a question worth asking. Indeed, very fair point. The other thing that is new here is that the government managed to get these agreements in large measure because they punted the toughest issue, namely wages, and they punted that off to binding arbitration. Now, most governments, of course, like to avoid binding arbitration because they always fear that the arbitrator is going to be too generous with the union in question, and governments don't want to be too generous in the money they have to pay out in salaries and wages and so on. For some reason, this government has embraced binding arbitration as a way to resolve these disputes. Any idea why the Minister of Education, Stephen Lecce, has been open to going to binding arbitration in the case of the teacher unions here, but not necessarily with any other unions? Well, I mean, there's a few different possibilities. One is that uh, they have a better sense inside cabinet of what the government's finances are than necessarily us uh, mere mortals on the outside. And they might feel like they've got a little bit more 
room to maneuver uh, in terms of uh, teachers' compensation uh, than they did even a year or two ago. Um, you know, the economy is recovering uh, reasonably well from COVID, and there's been a lot of job growth and some income growth. And uh, they, you know, the the government uh, may simply feel like, you know, what if we, you know, when you're talking about the education ministry, right? Like even small changes in teachers' compensation can be billion-dollar bills. For sure. Um, but they might feel like they've got the room for that uh, in the budget. Um, we do know that uh, the um, financial accountability officer has uh, just issued a, a report recently where they talked about uh, the government has um, socked away a bit more money in some of its contingency funds uh, that uh, uh, we don't have a explicit explanation for yet. So that might be the kind of thing that where it might be uh, that combined with a need to um, probably pay some retroactive pay for uh, Bill 124. Uh, that might explain some of it. I think we'll find all that out on the 26th of March. I think Budget we might. <laughs> I think we might. Okay, on to your column, my column. Okay, it's time now for a regular feature that we call Your Column, My Column, in which JMM and I reminisce about the columns that we wrote for the TVO website, tvo.org, over the past week. Go ahead, start us off. What have you got up your sleeve? So both of my columns this week are uh, kind of uh, dull affairs about uh, uh, really wonky matters of, of housing policy. Are you supposed and, to admit that? Uh, well, you know... It is on it, brand for you. It is what it is. <laughs> and uh, like I could go on about, uh, you know, the policies of like, how do we finance sewer construction? But I did that uh, on the website and people can read that. <laughs> so instead, I'm going to do something different here. Okay. Uh, we are going to return to uh, something we ha- used to do quite a bit more, which was uh, uh, quotes of note. And I'm going to take a clip from uh, the... The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, Perry Sound, Muskoka MPP, Graydon Smith. Uh, let's have a listen. We will be remorseless in our, op- in our, uh, <laughs> sorry, in our, uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Some days you got it and some days you don't. But we will not stop in our efforts to get this mill open. You know- Okay, first of all, you got to hand it to him. You know, he was just having one of those days. He's normally very good on his feet during question period. But, you know, as you and I both know, some days your tongue doesn't work and you just can't get the words out. And he had one of those moments. Uh, yes, absolutely. And unfortunately, when you're speaking uh, live to uh, a camera and the Hansard, you don't uh, get to edit the, your flubs out. Um, so we're absolutely not uh, dunking on the minister in no. this case. Uh, you know, uh, it happens to the best of them. Um, but it's an interesting moment because the minister, uh, obviously, you know, we're having a bit of fun with the clip, but the minister was responding to a question from the official opposition uh, about a pulp mill in Terrace Bay, which is uh, on the north shore of Lake Superior. It's about uh, 250 kilometers uh, northeast of Thunder Bay. And that mill has uh, been closed, uh, perhaps temporarily, but the uh, union and the New Democrats were uh, at Queen's Park earlier this week, uh, earlier that day. Um, They were uh, really raising a concern about whether that mill is going to uh, reopen. They say they've uh, had no real communications with the ownership of the mill. And, uh, you know, obviously we like to when we can uh, cast our view uh, uh, around the province to, to communities that don't necessarily get uh, a ton of attention. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, this has been an issue we've seen. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's been super common, but we've seen it a few times in the last few years where um, in some cases, these are mills that got substantial uh, government funding for things like um uh, uh, refits or environmental uh, sustainability grants from either the federal or provincial or sometimes both levels of government, um, and then they shut down and there's no accountability for, like, where did that public money go? Did it just get sent off to the shareholders of a foreign multinational? Or, you know, so that's a whole issue. And the other question, um, frankly, uh, that we've seen in other communities, and I'm thinking, I think it was Iroquois Falls um, about a decade ago now, uh, where uh, the mill shut down and and the owners of the mill um, effectively refused to let it reopen as a functioning uh, mill. They sold it. They eventually sold it to the municipality, um, but it was on the condition that it could not be reopened as a pulp mill. So, lots of really. Um, Uh, let's say, tumultuous times in the forestry sector. Obviously, this is a story that goes back a a while. It's been kind of a rough few decades for the forestry sector in the north. Um, But, uh, you know, this was an issue. I mean, obviously, as I say, uh, we're pegging it to a kind of a funny clip from question period, but it was an issue that I thought we could talk about a bit more. Good stuff. Well, I had a couple of columns this past week about Brian Mulroney. For obvious reasons, we know Canada's 18th prime minister died last month, February 29th, actually, at the age of 84. Two different columns. The first one focused on Mr. Mulroney's relationship with the three premiers of Ontario that he mainly had 
dealings with during his time. That would be Bill Davis, David Peterson, Bob Ray. Frank Miller was also premier during this time, but for such a short time, there wasn't really much to talk about there. The point was this. Yes, Mr. Davis and Mr. Mulroney got on very well, of course, because their brand of progressive conservatism was relatively similar. But it's also right to say that Mr. Mulroney got on very well with David Peterson, with whom he negotiated the Meech Lake Constitutional Agreement, and also with Bob Ray, with whom he negotiated the Charlottetown Accord. Two attempts at constitutional renewal. Ultimately, neither one enacted, but that's not to say it wasn't worth the effort. I also did another column uh, last week on the fact that the three titans, we got Brian Mulroney, we got John Turner, we got Ed Broadbent, who fought two historic elections in 1984 and 1988 against one another, and with Mr. Mulroney's death, they're all gone right now. And it really felt like a kind of a, just like a real turning of the page of history right now to see these three titans who were who would go after each other hammer and tongue in public, like absolutely brutal against each other, but behind the scenes actually quite admired, liked, and respected each other. And I'll give you just a couple of examples here. Brian Mulroney, after beating John Turner twice in the 84 and 88 elections, when Mr. Turner stepped down as liberal leader, offered him the ambassadorship to both Italy and the Vatican. Huh. Mr. Turner was a staunch Catholic, right. and he, he would have really enjoyed those posts and he would have represented Canada well, but he decided he wanted to go back to Bay Street, make, make some money. But the point is, Mr. Mulroney made the offer. Mm -hmm. And as Ed Broadbent stepped down around the same time as well as Mr. Turner, uh, he was given the presidency of a group that was being created called uh, Rights and Democracy, which was an attempt to export both around the world. And the gist, of course, that uh, the column tries to make the point that uh, it's one thing to go after each other in public, but behind the scenes, civility, respect, admiration, those are nice things. They had them then. I don't know if we have them today. Uh, I know we're going to go into the mailbag in just a moment, but I wanted to read this here because it is related to this subject. This is from a former member of the Ontario legislature named Jim Folds, who was the NDP member from Port Arthur from 1971 to 1987. I think his son Andrew actually is a member of the Thunder Bay City Council today. Anyway, another generation. Uh, apropos of my column that the three titans of the 1980s elections are gone, Mr. Folds wrote the following. We fought just as fiercely, if not more so, at Queen's Park, and I have the scars to prove it, and I am proud of every one. But like professional athletes, we had respect and admiration for those opponents who deserved and earned it, and we concentrated on the issues. More importantly, we did not doubt 99.9% .9 of our opponents were in politics to serve the public good. I think also we mostly had a sense of fun and humor about our craft, and about ourselves, and about our opponents, which helped to keep us balanced. When I think about politicians as different as Bill Davis, Darcy McHugh, Bob Nixon, Jimmy Auld, Bob Welsh, Floyd Lagren, and Eli Martel, they all had this sense that they took their work seriously, but they didn't take themselves too seriously. That's from Jim Folds from Thunder Bay, and I really like that take on politics, so I thought I'd include it here. Yeah, and you do still see glances of that at Queen's Park today, I would argue. Um, you know, there is still uh, congeniality and, and collegiality, um, uh, but it, I, I think it would be fair to say it's it's rarer um, than it used to be. Uh, one thing I will say, uh, and, and I'm not inventing this, I'm, I'm drawing from work done by the um, Samara Center for Democracy. Uh, in the federal parliament, it does seem like that um, collegiality has almost entirely disappeared. Right. Uh, you, you've, they've had reports where MPPs talk about not even feeling like they can have lunch with members from the other side of the aisle because p members of their own party will, you know, whisper and ostracize them, you know, for, for you know, even just talking to the other side. Which uh, is nuts. Which is nuts, yeah. absolutely yeah. nuts. Um, and, and I don't think it's quite that bad at Queen's Park yet. I mean, even that moment that, that we played earlier uh, with Graydon Smith, I mean, yeah, like I'm sure that in the moment, maybe the the uh, opposition parties uh, might have been like pointing and laughing at him, but they've all been there. They've all had those mm -hmm. on camera fumbles. And after the camera was turned off, I'm sure some people, you know, said, hey, you know, don't worry about it. Right. I have so. no doubt. Let me do one last note about this issue. Uh, and that is, ironically enough, one of Mr. Mulroney's greatest rivalries was with the current prime minister's father because it was Pierre Trudeau who repatriated the Constitution with an accompanying Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But because there was a separatist government in Quebec at the time, he did not get Quebec's signature on the agreement. Mr. Mulroney did achieve that with Meech and with Charlottetown, 
both of which died for other reasons, but Quebec did sign both of those agreements. Uh, and the expression we heard back in the day, as your shirt <laughs> said, the expression we heard was, Brian Mulroney's going to finish the job that Pierre Trudeau started by getting Quebec's signature. Mr. Trudeau, on February 29th, 40 years ago, went for that famous walk in the snow and decided at that moment that he was going to retire from public life. And Mr. Mulroney, this year, on February 29th, died. For two men who really were great political rivals, the notion that they will share that extraordinary day, yeah. February 29th, which only comes along once every four years, um, I don't know, I find that intriguing. Yeah, sometimes the stars align in, in just they weird, do. weird ways. And with that, on to our mailbag. If you've got a burning question or insightful comment, please send it along to us at this email address, on politics at tvo.org. JMM, what do we got to start this week? Uh, here's an email from a listener, Andrew Hunter, and a continuation of our discussion uh, around the 407 highway. Andrew writes, uh, hey, Steve and JMM, still faithfully listening to the podcast, so I'll have to check out the video to see your sartorial choices. <laughs> Timely. Uh, something worth noting is the road surface on the 407 was designed for heavy truck traffic, as are some of the new 401 sections near here, Ontario. Uh, paying the tolls for trucks would increase the lifespan of the asphalt surface of 401 and on connecting municipal roads for trucks destined for the industrial land the 407 passes through. Win-win, hmm. Andrew Hunter. Oh, that is interesting. What's he referring to there? Uh, so the 407 has a more durable uh, highway surface, like most roads you've ever driven on in uh, Ontario. Uh, the the uppermost layer of the road is just asphalt, very common. Um, but the 407 actually is uh, topped with concrete, makes it much more uh, durable. It lasts longer compared to asphalt. Um, maintenance costs uh, can be uh, higher, but you know it's a, a question of do you get what you pay for. Road engineers, I'm sure, geek out about this stuff. <laughs> um, it does make it more difficult to repair in some cases. You have to like lift slabs of the highway out and replace it with uh, uh, concrete. Um, whereas fixing a hole in the, a pothole in the 401 is like you know, pour some asphalt in it and there let you it go. go. Do right. you know what I've noticed? Uh, and I don't. I'm not on the 407 a lot, but sometimes when I go to Hamilton, uh, I take the 407. It's noisier. It's a lot noisier driving on the 4. And I don't mean the other traffic. I mean rubber hitting road is noisier on the 407 than the 401. Why would that be? Well, so it's just the, the difference that the, uh, the the difference in the noise that the tires make rolling over concrete versus asphalt. The concrete actually has to be um, brushed a little bit to give it some texture. It would otherwise uh, settle into a, a pattern that would be too slippery for road safety. So they add just a little bit of texture to the concrete in order to uh, improve road safety. But a side effect of that is you do get a bit of noise. Huh, never knew that. Okay, let's continue. Here's an email from a listener named Felix, who asks, Hi, Steve and JMM. Do we know what the provincial cabinet committees are and what their membership is? A little searching does not yield any recent results, even for a statutory committee like the Treasury Board. Best, Felix. Okay, Felix, this is uh, deep in the nerdy weeds of how governments work, but traditionally you got a cabinet and then a bunch of cabinet subcommittees, like priorities and planning is often one, social services, economic development, that kind of thing. Do we know what this particular government of Ontario has? We know for sure that there are th at least three cabinet committees because Ontario law requires that those committees be created and that uh, the premier uh, uh, publish the, the membership of those committees. So that's the Management Board of Cabinet, uh, Treasury Board, uh, and the Cabinet Committee on Emergency Management. Uh, so there are Ontario laws that created those committees or at least require them to be uh, created and require that uh, the members be appointed by an order in council. The orders in council are public documents uh, that you can uh, look up in Ontario. They're not always published in a timely fashion, I will just say, as <laughs> my, my gripe as a journalist. Um, but they are published online, and uh, you can look them up. You know, different governments um, have taken, I would say, uh, different attitudes towards how open they are about uh, cabinet committees. I think under Kathleen Wynne, for example, it was more common for the government to uh, be forthcoming about the membership of uh, cabinet committees uh, with the, the current government. Uh, like, I, I don't, it's possible I missed it. I don't remember any press releases uh, announcing the, the membership of cabinet committees. Um, you just sort of have to root through the, um, the, the listings for the orders in council. Gotcha. Let's finish up on this one here because it relates to something we talked about last week. Remember last week we talked about heritage properties and the difference between being listed, being designated for, for preservation. There were some different nuances there. And I mentioned at the time that uh, I remember covering this story 
almost 40 years ago. There was a train station in the west end of Toronto that I thought had been designated for preservation, but CN Rail tore it down anyway because they wanted to do some different kind of development there. And I remember Mayor Art Eggleton showing up at the time and having a press conference decrying how the railway took down that historic station uh, seemingly against the wishes of the city. I got this note on that story. It says, hi, Steve. On one of your recent programs, I believe that you indicated that a designated heritage railway station in the city of Toronto had been demolished with no penalty to the demolisher. I was head of the Historical Preservation Division of the Toronto Historical Board before retirement many years ago. As I recall it, designation by bylaw under the Ontario Heritage Act is done by city councils passing a municipal bylaw. But municipal bylaws do not bind the Crown. And so it seems that railway properties, being federal, could not be designated. My recollection is that the railways demolished a station in the junction area of Toronto, that's the one I went to, and also a station around King Street, west of Dufferin. These properties were probably listed, i.e. included on the city's then inventory of heritage properties, so I don't think the city had the power to place a penalty on the demolisher of listed properties. Best wishes, Marcia Cuthbert, and she signs it Vic 59. So I guess she graduated from Victoria College at U of T in 1959. And that would explain why nobody was published 40 plus, uh, was punished 40 plus years ago when those stra uh, train stations were unilaterally demolished. So thank you, Marcia. I, I want to put a spotlight on this because this is one of my favorite little uh, uh, topics. Uh, I have many. Um, <laughs> but uh, because, of course, planning powers, uh, municipal planning powers derive from provincial law. But the province cannot uh, impose any kind of uh, 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 legislation in an area of federal jurisdiction. Mm. Railways are a matter federal. of federal jurisdiction. So if CN wants to build a train station or knock down a train station, that's purely a federal matter. And uh, municipal planning policies cannot apply. Uh, CN could choose to comply with a municipal planning policy, but there's actually... Uh, th there has been a long-running issue. I think it's basically settled now because it, it, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. But out in um, Milton, I believe, uh, the uh, CN wants to build a new uh, train yard there uh, on their uh, rail line. And it conflicts with the planning policies of the local municipality and I think the regional municipality as well. Uh, but CN is like, your laws don't apply to us, more <laughs> or less. And they are 100 percent correct. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's just it's the kind of thing that crops up. You have a glint in your eye right now. You are so excited <laughs> talking about this kind of stuff. It really turns you on, doesn't it's, it? I, you know, federalism and <laughs> planning law and who, who doesn't love a good story about trains? I mean, it's got everything. Maybe. Uh, anyway, okay. <laughs> give, give, I was going to say something, but I'll take it back. Why don't you give the email address sure. one more time and then we'll get out of here. Uh, if you would like to ask us about any of the content on the show or just send in fun facts about trains, <laughs> uh, you can email us at onpolitics at tvo.org. Very good. That is the On Poly podcast for this March the 8th, 2024. You can follow our show on Apple Podcasts so that you get notified each time a new episode is available. And if you already follow our show, help a friend follow it too. Let's give the email address one more time because any feedback you've got, we're happy to hear it, good, bad, or indifferent. On politics at tvo.org is the special email address to reach us. Be sure to include your first and last name and what part of the province or world, for that matter, you're emailing from. Yeah. This week's episode was produced and edited by Matthew O'Mara. Video editing by Colin Kish. Production support from Jonathan Hallowell, Christine Gardner, Ariana Longley, Vito Tagarelli, Jeff Cusera, and Jennifer DeRosa. Our managing editor is Katie O'Connor. Lori Few is the executive producer of Digital. John Ferry is vice president, programming and content. Special thanks, as always, to our wonderful studio crew for making our video podcast happen. And until next Friday, everybody, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>